After the demise of a 10-year relationship, I found myself in my 30s ready to date again. I laid out ground rules for myself, all gleaned from past misadventures except for one. One rule was foundational, fundamental, both principled and primal, a rule I set out for myself as a young teenager and never wavered from. Do not date friends. I always, always drew a bright line between friend and potential romantic partner. The thought of crossing that line repulsed me. One New York spring morning, spring evening, I was co-hosting a party at a friend's place. The doorbell rang and there was my old pal Jay, wearing that sweet mischievous smile I was so fond of. We threw our arms around each other and swayed there in the doorway, laughing at how good it was to be together again. This was the first time in our entire friendship we were both unattached. Was there an unspoken mutual crush? Jay and I did not stick like glue that night, but as the party dwindled, we lingered. Eventually, it was just us and a bottle of whiskey. He left when the sun came up. Nothing earth-shattering happened that night. It wasn't my place, after all, and I have some manners. But we decided we should shift our relationship from friends to friends with benefits. I bent my rule, but truly, this was supposed to be casual sex. If I had left after the sex, it might have been. But the sex was explosive. It unfolded into sharing secrets, hopes and dreams, religion and divinity, and more sex. We knew it that night and we said it out loud, we are in trouble. We indulged the trouble for a couple of months. We were still seeing other people because it was all casual, so casual, but then I got a job offer in San Diego, California. And I started in two weeks. Go mode, research, flights, moving pod, rental car, extended stay hotel until I could find my own place. I was ready to leave the Northeast behind, leave the gray, slushy winters and the cramped subways, trade them for a life of jacarandas and jasmine. I was ready to say goodbye, but I wasn't quite ready to say goodbye to Jay. What about our sweet trouble? So in the kitchen one afternoon, I sort of shrugged and said, maybe you should come with me. Offhand comment, thinking out loud, <laughs> but he heard me. <laughs> maybe he needed a change. What was he doing with his life in New York? Jumping from shitty job to shitty job, rat hole apartment to rat hole apartment. Would sunlight kill him? I arrived in my new city, ready to bloom. Scored a place on Utah, bought my first car, started teaching, made friends, found the whistle stop. There wasn't really a comfortable place for Jay in my budding new life, but my offhand comment put me on a train that was not going to stop. I said, wait a minute, this is crazy. How about come for a week, come for a visit? But things on his end were getting weird. He said he'd get rid of his apartment and sleep in a storage unit for a week so he could afford a plane ticket because he had to buy the ticket in cash because he didn't have a credit card because his credit score was too low. I said, don't do that. <laughs> he said, don't worry about it. Then one day in October, he called me and said, I have my plane ticket. This is my flight. Be ready to pick me up. I did everything except say, don't come. Dread and giddiness danced in my stomach. I picked him up from the airport. He had the energy of a scrappy, lovable stray dog who needed a good meal and a bath. <laughs> Cue movie montage. Two cute idiots falling all over each other on couches, beaches, in the kitchen, in bed, out at bars, sneaking illicit candy into movie theaters, giggling like teenagers who are too old to be teenagers. My previous boyfriend was somewhere between a stick in a mud and the wet noodle. Fun was refreshing. 
fun was addictive. He'd make me breakfast before work. He'd dive into his exhaustive knowledge of cinema to find clips I could share with my film students. He encouraged me to name my big feelings. But he also referred to women as females. <laughs> he did not use the words breasts, boobs, or tits. No, he called them breastesses. His resume, which I found lying around one day, contained both lies and emojis. <laughs> that December, he told me, a nice Jewish girl, that I should celebrate Christmas because it isn't a Christian holiday, it's an American holiday. One more, one more thing. Jay had an unhealthy relationship with alcohol. Back in New York on a lunch date, when he ordered himself two cocktails at once and I ordered none, I thought, maybe I don't drink enough? <laughs> now that he was in my home, I saw he couldn't go a day without a drink. When he polished off everything in my liquor cabinet, he popped down to 7-Eleven to buy the largest can of Coors he could afford. One night, he came home several hours late from his new job, sat down on the couch with a burrito, covered it in sriracha, and ate it while drunkenly explaining that his night involved a bar fight with someone named Dragon. <laughs> the sriracha dripped onto his t-shirt. He licked it off. I wasn't angry, just disappointed. My sparkling boyfriend vanished and this sad schlub would be hanging around until morning. I knew it wasn't going to work. But he had schlepped across the country for me and I felt responsible and still addicted. My brain at war with my other parts. Finally, my exit appeared. In the course of a normal conversation, Jay uttered three little words. Marriage is bullshit. Perfect! He wasn't husband material, and he didn't believe in husbands. We wanted different things. I took a few days to get my thoughts together, and I broke up with him. But I couldn't just kick him out. He had nowhere to go. I let him stay for another excruciating month while he made arrangements. Every few days, Jay would ask, why are we breaking up again? We love each other. And I had the pleasure of rehashing the conversation. Six months after his arrival, I drove him back to the airport. The subway rats beckoned. He was already drunk that morning when he left. He almost missed his flight because he needed to spend several minutes just standing right outside my car saying goodbye to the neighborhood. I was a mess when I got home. Time for recovery. I scrubbed every inch of my kitchen because Jay loved to cook but refused to clean. I changed the filter on my car so it didn't smell like his cigarettes. I took all the t-shirts he left for me to sleep in to Father Joe's village. I solved the mystery of the missing wine glass when I discovered threatening shards and sticky dried booze puddles hiding under my desk. I hung a thrifted poster of Johnny Depp playing the piano on my closet and I swore I would keep it there until I was ready to sleep with other people again. I started doing yoga, but at night, my efforts stalled, and it was just me and that little black mirror. I indulged my withdrawal with unhealthy text exchanges with Jay. For weeks, I pinballed between progress and pain. One evening, Jay proposed over FaceTime. Fuck you, I replied, <laughs> and demanded radio silence. I took down the Johnny Depp poster. Spent a weekend in Tulum with an old fuck buddy. Went on dates, lots of dates. Things were going well and I should have just let it be. But that summer, on a visit to New York, I agreed to see Jay. Why? 
closure to be friends again? We met at a bagel place. No alcohol, broad daylight. All I remember is he told me he was sad we were never going to have sex with each other again, and he hated to picture me with another guy's dick in my mouth. Um, then don't. <laughs> Nobody invited you to do that. He tried to kiss me when I hugged him goodbye. I turned my face away and he stormed off into the subway. Chapter closed. I returned to my happy California home to live alone, take care of only myself. I was at the beginning of a beautiful year. However, little messages from Jay punctuated my beautiful year staccato like whack-a-mole. Sometimes he'd recommend a fun podcast or share a joke. But when the sun went down and the bottles opened, it was, love you always. I miss you so much. Links to sad songs by The National. <laughs> I ignored these texts. They intensified. My family flew out to meet my new boyfriend over Thanksgiving, and I woke up to Jay's epic drunk poetry. <laughs> my boyfriend threw me a surprise birthday party, and I woke up to a love letter from Jay. A new ping every week or two. <sighs> Mornings, I found a message waiting for me. Several thoughts stung me at once. The simple, this is annoying, a bug that won't leave me alone. The perverse, I can't believe this guy is still hung up on me. OMG, it's like so hard to get over me. <laughs> also genuine concern, dude, don't. She's just not that into you. I ignored him for a year. That's the conventional wisdom. Ignore unwanted ex texts and eventually they will stop. Any response is encouragement. I knew how to ignore unwanted attention. It was the same conventional wisdom my mom offered me when those bullies tortured me on the playground when I was a kid. Just ignore them. And I did, but they didn't stop. Neither did Jay. The following summer, as I was moving into my boyfriend's apartment, I changed my strategy regarding Jay. I called him. I asked, why do you keep doing this? And because he has no guile, he told me. He had come to think of my phone number as his personal diary. When he felt sad, he'd pour his sadness into my digits. My lack of response, he told me, made it easy to keep doing it. He was counting on my silence. My silence was permission. My inaction was an invitation. He was sending his feelings out into the void. No expectation of a receiver on the other end. I told him, no more nighttime texts. If you have something to say to me, say it while the sun is shining. That night, he sent me a string of poetic fuck yous, followed by a link to I Would Die For You by Prince, <laughs> and asked if he was overstepping. <laughs> I said, yes, you are overstepping. If you do it again, I'll block your number. I didn't hear a peep for months. The next Miss You arrived while I was full term pregnant with my first baby. I forgot about it as quickly as I read it. Another heartbreak song popped up a few months later. I saw it the moment he sent it during the small hours while I was nursing my infant son. <laughs> I blocked his number. Scrubbed him from my social media. Goodbye nostalgia for old friendships. But he still had my email address. I did not know how to block an email address. 
until receiving feedback from my fellow storytellers this month, I didn't even know that such technology was available on Yahoo Mail. So Jay's messages continued infrequently and with that warning for two more years. I was not willing to be a silent repository for his feelings. Ignoring him didn't work. Telling him to stop didn't work. I was ready to accept these messages as a fact of my life. I had, as the youngish people say, no fucks left to give. <laughs> That's when I got curious. Was there some way I could respond that would be so repulsive he'd want to stop? He was sending me things I didn't want to see. Could I send him things he did not want to see? He'd send, nothing compares to you. I replied with a note, you still owe me 50 bucks for the plan B. You can find me on Venmo. He'd send, unbreak my heart. I'd send, single ladies. Every breath you take, podcasts about sobriety. I considered sending dick pics. <laughs> the summer before my son's second birthday, I couldn't take it anymore. I emailed him three little words. Stop contacting me. That was it. The stake through the heart. Really? That was it? Had I finally killed our long dead relationship? All I heard was radio silence. A coda, and this is important. While in the thick of things, my sister urged a silver bullet I never used. Tell him you're married, she said. Tell him you have a baby. I refused, and here's why. One, it's none of his fucking business. We are not friends. I owe him zero access to my personal life. And two, as a social experiment, how many times do I need to say no before this man internalizes that no? How many times before the no stands on its own merit? Because the answer should be one. Heidi Handelsman.